Welcome to The Truth in This Art, your source for conversations at the intersection of arts, culture, and community. I am your host, Rob Lee, and today I am thrilled to have the pleasure of being in conversation with two guests, not just one, two, you know. I was like, I'm giving you guys all of these one person, great conversations, but it should probably be two guests. And today it's gonna be two guests. My first is an award-winning screenwriter, film director, photographer, entrepreneur, and educator from Detroit. Please welcome Danielle Aliska. And joining Danielle is a Detroit-born producer, filmmaker, still photographer, and media educator dedicated to amplifying marginalized voices and stories. Please welcome Juanita Anderson. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm glad we're able to do it. Um, and it's um it's a good way to to, to wrap up the week the week. Um it's Friday here as we're recording this. And um yeah, I like I like closing out a podcast on a Friday to have a conversation with people I've not met before. And it's like mm -hmm. gonna learn some things. It's a good wrap up. <laughs> so you know, as we we start off this conversation, I want to give both of you the space, and we can we can start with you, Danielle. Um, but both of you the space to to introduce yourselves, and I do my sort of um, you know cut and paste online amalgamated sort of um, introduction, but I find that often something is left out. You know, as I was talking about a little bit before we got started, you'll find like, yo, bro, I'm a boxer as well, and I also paint, <laughs> so you left that out. So if you will. <laughs> Could you um, describe your, you know, introduce yourself and then we'll move into some of the, the following questions? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Danielle Eliska and I'm from Detroit. I love my city so very much. I am a screenwriter, a film director, a photographer, an educator and entrepreneur. Um, born and raised Seven Mile Evergreen, West Side all the way. <laughs> so and I'm so happy to be back home, actually. So, yeah, it's good. Yeah. And uh, Juanita? So I'm Juanita Anderson. I was born and raised in Detroit. Uh, I am a film and television producer, a documentary filmmaker, a photographer, a media educator, and programmer. And I guess that sort of kind of sums it up, except I love Detroit. I was born in the north end of Detroit. Hey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Grew, uh, raised on the west side, actually, the near west side, near Highland Park. Uh, and now I am back in Detroit after multiple returns. This is my third return, and I'm here to stay. Uh, and I live on the east side now. Awesome. I think I think Juanita also left out legend because she's been doing this thing for quite some time. So <laughs> we can add that to her whole resume, too. <laughs> See, I, I told you inevitably I was going to leave something out that I'm like, oh, <laughs> right. I wasn't aware of that. And it's it's an, it's an, and thank you both, because it's I think it's very important to especially when you're you're doing one of these these types of interviews. It has the locale component like, you know, when someone talks to me, one, they don't they don't hear an accent. So they're not sure where, where I'm from. I'm like, man, I'm from East Baltimore. And they're like, oh, OK, cool, cool, cool. You say you're too <laughs> weird. And um so when when someone describes that as part of their introduction to me, it's like that's important. That's embedded. Um, mm -hmm. So going back a little bit um, to the to the roots, if you will, you know, filmmaking, that's that's a, a big piece here. So what was that that initial sort of inkling that maybe you would pursue filmmaking? Maybe you would pursue something creative. Like what was that first like motivation at first inkling for you? If, if I could start with you, Juanita. Oh, I didn't know for a long time that I was going to be pursuing filmmaking, but I think I always knew that I was going to do something creative. Um, it was sort of embedded in me as a child growing up in Detroit. Uh, my mom used to take me to concerts and to plays. Even as a little kid, she was a single mother and she had places that she needed and wanted to go. And so I was her date oftentimes. <laughs> um, but I also took dance lessons and piano lessons. And then by the time I was like 10 or 11, I started following the bigger kids. Uh, we all used to get dropped off at Sunday school and my church was not far from the DIA. So we went to Sunday school, but skipped church and hung out at the DIA. I spent um, hours 
every Sunday in front of the Diego Rivera mural, which was my favorite place to just meditate. And then we hop back right before the end of church, uh, just in time for our parents to pick us up. And <laughs> so I always knew that art was in my blood. I just didn't know that what turn it would take. Um, I studied television, not thinking about film at the time, even though the major was radio, television, film. But I actually learned to be a photographer first um, before I really developed an interest in filmmaking. Um, my first job in public television, and I'm not going to tell you how long ago it was, but I am going to sort of tell you because it was at a time when if we were doing anything on location, we actually had to shoot on film, on celluloid. So I really love the tactile nature of having to edit that celluloid. I mean, there was something really special about being tactile um, that really encouraged me. And I found that I really gravitated to telling stories about real people who were doing real things in the real world. So that's my start. Thank you. Yeah. The short version. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Um, you know, for me, it, it's kind of like multifold, right? So I think it was like a forced marriage when I think about filmmaking and writing. It's something that I always loved. When I was very young, I would write. Right. And my mom, she saw that in me that I love to read and write. Uh, so she would take us to the movies a lot of times. My sister was the dancer. So she would take us to the movies and we'll go and see one movie, but then we'll like go and sneak into other movies. So it would kind of be like a full day of seeing like three to four movies. And I, I never got enough of it. I always loved it so much. Another component to it is that my grandfather was actually a photographer and filmmaker. So a lot of times when I do these interviews, I talk about how my mom used to take us to the drive-in. She would, you know, get us in our PJs and we'll be in the back of the trunk because we had like this hatchback and we'll pack snacks and we'll go and see movies. I always tell that part, but, you know, it wasn't until I started really kind of thinking and digging through some of the archives of what my grandfather was doing. He had films and he had beautiful photography that he took, you know, but he worked at, of course, you know, Ford. So that was like his day job, his way to provide for his family. But I think his passion was, you know, filmmaking and, and photography. And I feel like it was just that download, that's, that innate thing that was just with me from a very young age. So, you know, I don't think I can really separate or, or find pinpoint the exact time. I just know I was writing little stories to my mom and she would hang them on the refrigerator. And then from there, I was acting out these stories with my sister with my Barbie dolls. And then it became this big thing. And I was always talking about, well, this Barbie is going to fall off the cliff and die. You know, so it was always something very dramatic, some plot twists coming up some kind of way. So I think it was just always there for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's the creators create. And I always start yeah. thinking through you know, when we're younger, we just kind of are doing it, you know, when we're, we're kids, especially that sort of early creativity, um, you know, and, and this just, just relates before I move into this next question. But, you know, I remember now, I remember back in the day, I was like, I'm going to do a comic book. I remember going through the whole process, the inking, the writing, all of the stuff. Right. And I was one of those students that was like, ah, I was a pretty good student, but I was like, I'd rather do the next fun thing, the creative thing. And now, as like an adult, a fully formed adult, like, you know, I have hair on my face. And uh, and I'm like, man, the prospect of doing a comic right now feels a little bit more like work. How am I going to monetize it? How am I going to put it out there? All of that, that different stuff. And I just think it's, it's sort of that shift. And I think the com important part about it, and I was observing both of you and, and describing creativity, so it's a lot of teeth being shown, a lot of smiles because it's <laughs> that freedom, it's that feeling yes. of of fun and enjoying what you do. So, and and I enjoy what I do. You'll see my teeth a lot here. Um, so, and and moving to this this next question, um, and it it pins back a little bit to the introductions. Uh, Detroit, speak a bit about your creative influences in your work and 
and how Detroit, whether being from there, sort of, you know, like Baltimore is very DIY. So that's baked into what I do. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure out how to wire this. I'm going to learn it on my own and I'm broke. So I'm going to figure it out though. <laughs> so that's sort of what's baked in. We're, we're a sort of figure it out town and that's baked into what I do. So, you know, obviously creative influences in your work, but also speak on sort of the, the locale, the city and how that impacts your work. Do you want to take it? Juanita, you want me to take it? Uh, I'll try. I, you know, <laughs> I think it wasn't until I moved to Boston that I realized, and I lived in Boston for 15 years, uh, that I realized what it meant to be from Detroit, a girl from Detroit, and what it really mm-hmm. meant and how much pride I had in my city. Um, first of all, it's a Black city, no matter what anybody else tells you. Um, but I think it's also a city that understands that there's a whole world out there Um, and that we are framed not only by our relationships with each other uh, as Black people, but also by a broad view of the world. I'll let you pick it up from there, Danielle, and might come back. (laughs) I like that. I like that handoff right there. (laughs) Yeah. You know, um, Detroit, I think it's really unique to meet anyone from Detroit because they're going to rep it. Like, (laughs) I don't know, not one Detroit person that's not like I'm from Detroit and they love the city. Um, You know, and I know we get this crazy rep about being this city that's desolate, et cetera. But every city's been through that. New York's been through that. You know, Watts has been through that. Uh, Detroit, Chicago, every place has been through that. But we have always been here and been very present. I think one of the most powerful things that I know I've experienced in going away to New York and living in, in New York is realizing how much of a community the artists have here. There's a togetherness here that I haven't found anywhere else. There's a support system that I think uh, Detroit artists innately have. They share resources. They share information. They share how they do processes. When in other places that I've been, everybody's kind of like cliquish standoffish because it might be this threat that you may take their practice and, and learn it and be better than them. But here in Detroit, I will have to say... Like you already know, it's Motown. It's so many talents here. We aren't just like a one-off prodigy, but like there are prodigies that are birthed out of Detroit and we are no separation. We're not an exception to the rule. Like all of us are that. And I'm not just trying to like gas us or put batteries in our backs. Like we literally have that that engine and we have this thing, we have the talents to back it up. I think anyone who says that they're artists from Detroit, you can take it to the bank that whatever work they're putting out is going to be good work. It's going to be their best work and their creative work and their approach is going to be unique and different. And I think also, with, you know, talking about Baltimore and how it's a DIY, you know, Black people, we don't have a lot of resources, but we're going to make it happen. I mean, if you really think about Tubi right now, I mean, everybody may not be a fan, but yo, we got the hood movies on lock. <laughs> <laughs> on to be. So I'm just saying like, we're going to always find a way and they may not have the training that I have or that Miss Juanita has, but they're making their movie. So it's always a way of finding resources and finding a voice. But also if there is not a way, we're going to either find one or we're going to make one. And I think that's a model that you can assign to Detroit people and Detroit artists. If we're going to find a way or we're going to make a way. And I think that's one of the most powerful tools that we have um, within our community is that togetherness, that cohesiveness, that uh, the the willingness to share resources without being afraid because we're not intimidated by one another. We want to support one another. And in that, I love my city. We're second to none when it comes to that kind of community. That That's just the way I feel. I do want to pick up on that. Um, because I think particularly, and, and it pertains to all Black people, artists or not, uh, in, in whatever walk of life about making way. But I want to talk about Black women artists for a minute, mm-hmm. um, because I think one of the things in, in that both Danielle and I treasure, honor, and want to carry forward, if I can speak for you for Absolutely. It's this long legacy of Black women artists 
mm-hmm. in Detroit and around the country who have created space to do our own work. We have had to create the space to do our own work. And as we do so, we mentor others and uh, create space for other people to do their work as well. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're about. Mm-hmm. I stand in agreement. And I think, you know, going with the Black women theme, it's like, Black women, we are so, <laughs> I think we are the best. <laughs> On the planet, we hold it down. We hold everyone down. And again, I think within that can be um, this power, but also it can be this negative connotation where people lean on us too much, where they expect us to hold everything down. I'm not saying it in that context and where we should be taking on everybody else's problems like we have been for so long. But I think when it comes to resilience and tenacity and really pushing through some of the adverse situations that we may go through, we have a testimony that we tell just by nature. I think we have a spirituality about us that is innate where we are like Mother Earth's daughters and we carry so much within ourselves to give, but also to heal. And I think a lot of times within the work that Black women do, we're not all only thinking about ourselves. We're thinking about our communities. We're thinking about our families. We're thinking about our people. We're thinking about our sons, our daughters, our husbands, our wives, our everything. And we are always reaching deep down within ourselves and we're bringing out healing. So even within whatever stories we're telling, whether it's through photography or filmmaking or documentary, we are reaching deep within ourselves and, and giving healing salves, bombs to so many people. Um, with our words, with our thoughts, with our work. And I think that people should treasure, you know, definitely all artists, but specifically Black women artists, you know, lift us up even more on a panel because of the work that we do, because without us, there would not be so many different things. So I always just want to make sure people know where I stand when I highlight women in my work. And it's the reason why my company is focused on telling stories that center, you know, female protagonists and Black culture, the Black diaspora, because those are the stories that I want to tell. And like Miss Juanita said, stories about just everyday people, ordinary people are the most magnificent stories. We have stories of great people. And yes, I love that. But sometimes it's the people on the like, you know, who's not getting that shine, who actually are making everything the world go go around so you know it's just important to make sure we are telling just these authentic stories in every single way i mean it it, it hits home like and you know i want to move into this this next question and i have a few that are about a announcement um but i want to move into this this next question because you know it aligns right where you know, I do this podcast and folks reach out like I'm over 700 episodes in and, you know, people ask like, how do you curate it and how do you do this? And I stopped mentioning numbers like one year I did 300 episodes, 333 episodes to be exact. Numbers wow. burned into my mind. <laughs> and in one month I did with the exception of one person, it was like March of like maybe 2022. I was like, I'm just going to do women this entire month. So I put out 35 episodes that month in a 31 day month. And it's like, why? And it's like, because these stories need to get out there. These mm-hmm. folks may have not have had a chance to share their story the way that they would like to share it. Or maybe someone didn't feel like their work was super interesting or important. And, you know, they had these these different challenges. So in that vein, speaking about sort of, I got two things. It's sort of like, what is it about the the process of working in sort of the, the visual realm, whether it be photography, whether it be filmmaking, even even in the, the the writing piece of it, but the full scope, what is the most fulfilling part of that? And on the flip side, what are some of those those hurdles? Because uh, you know, as I, as I was touching on, you start talking unrepresented voices and people that look like you and I. It's oh, we, eh, we don't see a story there. I don't know if that's interesting. Mm-hmm. So, what is your experience been? Uh, if you want to start off, Danielle. Um, so I know you asked two particular questions. So, uh, within the film photography screenwriting world, I can't separate them. They all kind of go together. I'm a little bit different from with Miss Juanita where 
photography came for me last. Um, it was always writing, right? Um, writing was the passion. I knew I wanted to write in some capacity. And then when I saw Spike Lee and I saw Casey Lemons and I saw Gina Prince Blythewood and, you know, uh, Julie Dash, when I saw their work and I saw what they were doing, then I realized that being a filmmaker was very much possible for me to tell stories about my people. Um, specifically thinking about Casey Lemons, I mean, if you look at my wall, you would see that I have Eve's Bayou up here because that hit me so hard as a child because that was literally my childhood experience because I'm Creole. Like, so it was like the auntie would have a dream and you had to stay in the gate the whole summer because they were worried if you're going to hit by, you know, so, so that whole story was a lived experience for me um, and thinking about seeing boys in a hood as a young person and being so completely moved and, and constrained by the story just to know that these people were a cousin or an uncle or a brother and realizing that finally they came out of this tropey narrative and they had some some layers there where they had humanity about them you know so I think there was so much positivity in being able to see these individuals so again um to bring it full circle they all go together I can't separate them photography came literally after grad school and it was because I needed to always be looking through the camera to see what a beautiful frame was so it was kind of practice at first sure. and then people were like hey you should put your work in a show. And then from there, I've have I've had I've been in at least 10 exhibitions and I've had a solo exhibition. And so now photography has become this beautiful part of the process. So it's always about telling stories. It's looking to Gordon Parks and you know, he did everything. He did it all and he did it well. So it's looking to him and, and gathering inspiration from him as an ancestor and using that download in, in my work as well. As far as like the hurdles. I would have to say it's going to always be first and foremost finances. To be really, really honest, um, the talent is there, even whether it's taught or if it's innate. It's definitely there. I remember judging a panel of women directors. And within that, you had so many different cultures, right? And whenever I saw Black women's work, and I had to give like a yes or no answer, then they had a comment section, I would see the Black women's work and it was incredibly interesting, but it may not have been 4K resolution and 619, you know, 69 or anything. And I realized the value in their work. And I was so happy that they asked me to be one of the judges. So in the comments, I'm like, yes, these things may be compromised, but this is why. And then, but the stories were incredible. And then you had like a white woman, again, no shots, but they were doing work and the stories weren't that fantastic, but the image looked beautiful and it was polished and it was this and that. And I'm like, no, right. <laughs> you know, but not to, not throwing it under the bus, but the story just wasn't fantastic, but they had the resources that we don't have access to easily. I've heard people talk about the fact that they were broken. They got a little seed money from my auntie and a seed money would be like $250,000. And I'm like, honey, please, we don't have the access. To, I can't go ask my auntie for $250,000. You know, it's hard enough for me to raise that kind of money within my community because we're all struggling trying to, you know, make ends meet. So I think one of the biggest things is having the resources and then maybe finding crew that that's black and brown. You know, that's what has been my experience. Um, but yeah, Miss Juanita, what do you think? So did uh, in terms of obstacles on the finances, but I would also say and bravo to the to be hood <laughs> because i mean it really goes back to 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 making space i think it's a bit larger in terms of the industry itself and the obstacles that are put in front of us by gatekeepers if we mm. allow them to gatekeep us. Mm. Um, and in some cases we have to, but that in, in, in term, it, that's in terms of funding, in terms of resources, uh, in terms of being able to get your films out into the world. Um, and again, we have to create those spaces in order for all of that to happen. Um, I founded years ago, co-founded an organization which today is called Black Public Media, 
It was called the National Black Programming Consortium back in 1978 when we started working on it um, because there was not the funding going to black filmmakers uh, or television producers. There was not the means for distribution um, for so much work that was out there and getting created with no money, but just labor, pure guts and grit uh, for it be seen, to be seen. And there was no place to honor it. Right. Um, so again, you know, those are the kinds, it's an industry wide issue um, that I think we're working to shift by any means necessary. You know, um, what gratified, gratifying about the process. Oh my gosh. I think for me, it's the process of discovery and, and experience and really looking at real life and those stories that come out of it. Um, I think the hardest part, I know you didn't ask this question is letting it go once it's finished. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, because you always want to reshape and say, Oh, I wish I could have done this differently or I'd like to try this. And somehow you just got to let it go. Yeah. <laughs> I hear that. It, it, it's, it's definitely, and and thank you. It's, it's definitely something I, I relate to in in, in doing this. And um, I talk to painters a lot, and that whole joke about painters they're never really done. They just kind of stop. It's just like, ah, I guess it's done. I don't know. And <laughs> even when I'm doing this, like I used to go through and meticulously look for every um and uh all of the stuff and i started looking at it i'm like this doesn't sound like a conversation anymore it just sounds like just words are being thrown back and forth and mm -hmm. sort of like that extra polish that overly sanitized it starts feeling almost it, it's it's remote from what the actual intent is when we have mm -hmm. real conversations which you know there's a framing mechanism here obviously but the intent is to be a conversation. So when it stops feeling like that, it's just like something's lost. Something's lost here with this goal of, well, if I just clean this up and trim it down and have it to be a perfect 45 minutes, it's something's lost. It doesn't fit. <laughs> um, so I, I want to move into sort of this last chunk, if you don't mind. Um, and um, I got to say, con congratulations on you, you two both being inaugural seed and bloom Detroit grantees. Is that, is that, that's, the, that's what I'm reading here. So <laughs> what what does it mean to receive sort of that, that grant and, and sort of what are the ideas that of how you're going to incorporate sort of, you know, this 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 funding, this grant or have you into, you know, your work? If you can start with you, Daniel, please. Yeah, of course. Um, it's a breath of fresh air, you know, for any artist to be able to receive any funding in order to do work. That's kind of like, oh my gosh, half the battle. Because then now I can focus on the work that I want to do because I have the funding to do it. So I think it's it's a beautiful gift. Um, we are also grateful and it's such an incredible cohort, not just me and Miss Juanita, but we're among some fabulous artists. So I am excited to see all of the things that we decide to put out into the world. Um, what I'm focusing on specifically is building Neighborhood Bodega, which is my production company. Uh, it was once called Conjure Noir Films, but people thought that I was only making like noir films. So I was like, OK, so not, they're not getting the Conjure Black. So I had to change the name a little bit and I made it very specific to the two places that I love, which is Detroit and then Brooklyn, because I'm a Detroit baby and I was raised here. But Brooklyn definitely made me and I'm so thankful for that experience. So it's called Neighborhood Bodega. And it, it's that because I want it to really feel communal. I want it to be about my people specifically. And again, like, you know, I said that I'm telling stories about women and Black culture in the Black diaspora. That is who I'm centering in my stories and these other stories that I'm telling, you know, from a very organic place. So I love narrative films so very much. And we do narrative, but we also have had clients for documentary. I've also directed commercials and all kinds of things. So it's definitely like a full, well-rounded production house that has the ability to take something from de development all the way through to um Product, pre, uh, post production to the festivals. I'm not a distribution house, but I will try to find some way to get the work out into the world. So that's a beautiful thing. Um, 
you know, of course, one of the touchstone inspirations for me is going to always be Ava DuVernay, how she's built her, her company in such a beautiful way. So using her as, a, you know, a guide and a template and how to do that, you know, in this space here in Detroit is definitely uh, what I'm looking forward to and, and using as a light, a beacon of light. Unlike Dan Danielle, I've never considered myself an entrepreneur. Uh, and I suddenly realized that it's time that I think of myself in that regard. Um, I've always been very project centered because especially with documentary, it takes so long uh, to find all the money that is needed to do all the work that is needed. So I've always centered the project and not necessarily my company and my business. Uh, so this, I think, opportunity really causes me to shift my thinking and really think about how do I grow a business that works to sustain my practice? Uh, and at the same time, uh, to Danielle's earlier point about being able to find, you know, black and brown people to work as crews, I think I've always felt it as my responsibility, especially in coming back to Detroit, to really work to build um, our own community's infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, which I think, you know, is we've got problems. I mean, both in terms of how, I mean, this Detroit has long been a commercial industry, a commercial filmmaking and, and, and practices have really been the lay of the land. So things like production houses or post-production houses are monetized to address the commercial entities. Unlike a New York, say, for example, or even a Toronto that understands that independent filmmaking comes with different cost centers then. So, you know, I mean, they have post-production houses, have commercial rates, they have independent rates, they have, oh, you can work late at night for a really deep discount if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> but how do we not only think about the infrastructure that we need to support ourselves as filmmakers, but how do we bring up um, the cinematographers, the gaffers, the grips, the sound people that are in the making here in Detroit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. They need, people need those opportunities. And... Um, I think that I'm currently working on a project um, with a cinematographer who is uh, finally, after multiple years as an IATSE member, is now a bona fide director of photography. It's a Black woman, woman and there are very few Black women <laughs> directors of photography yes. who are IATSE certified. Mm -hmm. But along the way, and she's from Detroit originally. Oh, wow. Uh, she lives in L.A., but I'll be bringing her in for this project and along the way, bringing in Detroiters to work alongside her to gain mm -hmm. that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I feel, you know, having Fundy to do more work uh, will enable me to help build that infrastructure in a number of ways. That's great. And um, definitely I, I echo that sentiment around, like I, I, I described it. I had to um, speak uh, probably about six months ago. Um, I, I got some funding last year to fund this because this is kind of the, the independent media wave and all of that different stuff. And it's like half respected, half not, you know, or whatever it is. But, you know, people aren't just throwing money towards it. So, you know, I was able to get some funding. And the key theme was being able to see the... I guess the 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 opening a bit more of this. These are all these other things that I can do, whether being more entrepreneurial in it, building capacity is the way I was mm -hmm. describing it. Um, and that led to this opportunity to to teach. It led to me doing a podcast on a boat for some reason. I can't swim. Right. And I was on a I was on a podcast on a boat and I'm like, oh, so this is where it ends. I can see it now, you know, <laughs> but having an experience that extends the boundaries of of what I do creatively and 
it's not, it wasn't like a huge piece of money, but it was enough in the big scheme of things, but it was enough for me to, with that grind and with that hustle to be able to extend it and look out for folks in the community that are doing stuff. It's like, oh, well, hey, you have some talent in this area. I need someone that could maybe shoot this video podcast for me. So here's a couple G's or, you know, hey, I, I want to be able to do this event. Oh, you don't have the funding to do this event? Just throw my name on it. I'll sponsor your event, do a parade for New Orleans or what have you, and trying to be a person that's in the community to help with sort of that creative ecosystem and, and filling in some of those gaps. And it sounds like that's, you know, something that, that's there, whether it be doing more work that's in, in, in and around Detroit or working with folks that are from, from the city. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I was feeling real passionate right there. Um <laughs> So, um, and, and I, I want to get this, I have, um, sort of like, cause both you kind of touched on both of these questions. And I feel a little like, all right, I'm you know, kind of overachieving. I don't like that. I don't, I don't like when people are overachieving. That's why I'm making <laughs> these rapid fire questions at the end a little hard, but, um, so sort of this, this last one I'll ask, what has the, the perception been? Cause I've seen, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, Daniel, some of the 2 B stuff and I've seen, um, just people are making movies. I see like, it was one, like, it's, it's ridiculous. I think I saw like a show on there called, uh, maybe it was a dirty D or something. And I was like, this is wild. But I was like, there's like four seasons. I was like, good on y'all. Y'all making it. And that's the thing I dig. And I'm, then I'm engrossed. I'm like, all right, what's going to happen here? So what is that, that scene like? Because it's, you know, as far as like the filmmaking and is it just, is it the grind? Is it, and, and I, and I know it was touched on, but I just want to dive back in a little bit deeper. How, how is that, that scene and how will sort of, you know, seed and bloom and, and similar programs, I suppose, help with sustainability and, and equity if the folks getting opportunities, folks being able to grow those sort of skill sets that maybe other cities have like in spades? Yeah. Well, for me, I'm not on the to be scene, so I don't even have community with those people. I mean, not yet. You know, I don't I don't have community with the to be creators. Um, and again, I just got back to Detroit in 2020. So I got back in the middle of the pandemic. So I wasn't able to have like that kind of community. I, we're just coming outside to play. Right. So. I would aspire to connect with these people, but I feel like our works are vastly different the way we approach things. So um, my approach to my work is not how their approach is to their work. And that's no shade, of course. Like I said, they, ha they have an incredible space. They've carved out, carved out an important space for themselves. Like, you know, again, it's just like how, and I went to go see Regeneration Black Cinema again for like, I think the fourth time today in Detroit at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And they had a, they, every, we, they made a way, right? So thinking about Black exploitation, thinking about, you know, Black and white films, silent films, et cetera, there was always like these places where people found a voice, um, radical filmmaking, uh, you know, revolutionary filmmaking, all of these different things. So I, I think that, Again, I can't speak to that specifically, but I believe that they are going to continue on with the films that they're making. Um, and they did, you know, they they found a way and they made a way. <laughs> they did both. So I know that they will continue on just as myself and Juanita and the rest of us will continue on as well. And um, in, in the in the research earlier, I did look at that. Uh, the, the, it was a video, I think, for uh, well, maybe MP. No, it's PBS. Um, about regeneration. And I was like, oh, hey, oh, yeah. I recognize yes. that name. So, you know, <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm not there, but I got my tentacles everywhere trying to <laughs> trying to be up on, on things. Um, yes. So that's sort of the the, the wrap up on the, the real questions. Um, and again, congratulations. And I'm looking forward to seeing like sort of what's next. Um, and I'll probably be in, in Detroit to maybe see it a little up close. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Absolutely. Uh -oh. Look, welcome. We we always welcome people to come to the D. Usually people come here and be like, oh, we need to move here. And we like, well, come on in. So <laughs> look, not for nothing. I, I did think that when I was there and I was like, hey, no. <laughs> I mean, I was I, look. I wait nothing but car hard, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, you'll fit right in. <laughs> um, and so, so I, I want to ask the. I got four rapid fire questions, and as I tell everyone, don't overthink these. These are just fun questions. Um, uh -huh. 
<laughs> I like that response. <laughs> it's like it's like a shark smelling blood. It's like, yeah, uh oh, yeah, tell me more. All right. Uh, so here's the first one, um, and we'll start off with you, Juanita. Juanita, um, who who's a a key person in your artistic circle? Like someone you might bounce bounce an idea off. Uh, someone you're like, what do you think of this particular piece of uh, of, of, a, of a project you're working on? Who comes to mind for you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know you know you said don't overthink it and so I'm not going to answer your question directly but I'm going to talk to you about somebody who's been on my mind uh this well actually this last year uh Gail Christian uh who's not an artist but a journalist uh who died a year ago I think in April um, but she actually was a pioneering journalist who worked on the West Coast uh, for many years and then um, went to PBS as the first uh, Black news director at PBS, director of news and public affairs. But she was very much a mentor to me and was a person that I bounced ideas off. Also, speaking of regeneration, Gosh, and she's been on my mind lately, too, is the late Pearl Bowser, mm -hmm. uh, who was a film scholar, film curator. Uh, she actually did much of the work in cataloging what would become the filmography, the extensive filmography of Oscar Michaud. Um, but she was also someone that I could always go to and bounce ideas off and know that I was going to get an honest answer. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, so sometimes I still talk to these people, <laughs> even though they're ancestors now. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank and you. I have to mention uh, Gail again, too, because one of the things that she did was realizing that, again, back to this industry question that and, and the issues of the industry itself that women, Black, Brown, and Indigenous women were really important and are important. And she found a way to bring Black, Brown, and Indigenous women, writers, producers, directors, um, actors together in a series of retreats. And I've made just some tremendous lasting friendships uh, as a result of her efforts in doing that. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> Um, for me, it, that's really, really easy. <laughs> My husband is an incredible artist. His name is Mario Moore. So I go to him. I bounce ideas off of him all the time. And then I do have like a second person that I talk to who is like my you know, my road dog in creating. He's the cinematographer that I usually work with. His name is Jeremy Brockman and he's from Detroit. So yeah, those are my two go-to people. But Mario, all the time, <laughs> middle of the night. Hey, I got this idea. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I I was telling you, uh, Danielle, about uh, my person. I was like, yeah, so we yes. were talking with Spike back in the day, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Let's get this feed, this feedback, get these downloads. Yes. <laughs> so, so when you send mozzarella, she's like, nah, that's less of that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, my, my partner's always always my person of like, is how how yes. bad is this idea? How goofy is this idea? Yeah. And, and and having having that that trust or what have you, I think that's that's really important. And you know, having having folks that are around, it's like, tell me if this is bad. Tell me if this is right. why. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, and I, I'm not even good at this. This this next one is is sort of like one or the other. I think. Uh, when you so, are you an early bird or a night owl? Like in, mm. in terms of that uh, sleeping. I'm an early bird. <laughs> I can Same. answer that question. Mm -hmm. I love morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate um, <laughs> this time change that we just did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it totally disrupts my morning schedule. I'm, I, I like to get up at five, have my morning coffee, do my writing, mm. do my thinking. I mean, it's quiet. I can, you know, go for a walk if I want to and still have the rest of the day. Yeah. This savings time, I want my daylight in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's great. It's a great answer. Yeah. I, I'm an early bird too. I love to get up early. It's quiet. You know, um, I love the sound of just nature waking up, you know, it, it's the soundtrack for me writing, but you don't hear too much and it's not too much of a distraction. It's just me getting up and doing my work. I mean, I will do work at night, trust, especially if I have deadlines. We just had a Kresge deadline. So it was like, honey, you got to stay up until I was up until like three, four o'clock in the morning rendering, right? You do the work, but for me to really sit down and ride and feel like get my tea going, like my incense, you know, summon the ancestors and then sit down and write morning time. Yeah. Definitely setting the <laughs> stage there. Um, yeah, I'm early as well. So we're three for three. Um, and <laughs> I, I do that sort of, I've been getting up at four, four wow. a.m. 30 for the last like few weeks. And it, it, you know, somebody accepted me. It was just like, yo, look, it's the 5 a.m. club. Get up, you knock out a bunch of stuff. You get all of these sort of early wins. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in terms of like process and even prepping, like today is a Friday. So I'm prepping for all of my interviews for next week and getting all of that stuff locked in and keyed in. And I'm better earlier in the day as it gets later. It's like, oh, man, where's that bed at? Yeah. Oh, oh great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got I got two more. I got two more. Uh, what is your most treasured possession? We we all have these things that we like, but we go to the we go to, let's say, if you're have an office day job, right? It's like every place I go, I'm always bringing this one thing. I, I had a had a guy I interviewed, um, Stevan Smith, he's a media professional. And um, he was saying like, I take every lanyard that I've ever had with me because it just shows me my journey a bit. That was what I was taking out of his conversation. So is there like a prize possession that either of you, you have that it's just like, it's always there, I always get energy from it? To be really honest, like I know this is probably the unconventional answer, but it's my health. Like that is my most prized possession because if I have my health about me, I'll be able to navigate space. If we're talking about something materialistic, I have this hat that says Detroit Brooklyn girl and I got it made when I was in New York and I wear that on every film set. So I don't, it might be my good luck hat. So yeah, my health and my hat. <laughs> good. It's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so for me, it's not a single thing, um, but I collect art in addition to creating it. Um, and I'm very careful in terms of what I choose to collect because it has to speak to me spiritually. Mm. And I think being surrounded, and often, most often, it's artists that at the very least I have met. Yeah. Um, so to be able to treasure this gift of spirit uh, from these artists is really important to me. And, and I think I, there's not a room that doesn't have art in it in my house, including my bathroom and kitchen. It's <laughs> <laughs> wow. great. Um... <laughs> I, I have the, I'm recording, you know, broadcasting, I guess, podcasting um, from the home studio. And, um, you know, I, I have these conversations and I'm like, ah, you know, I don't know. It's a little new agey. And I was like, no, nah, just, just live with it. Just live with it. Mm -hmm. And I would get things from folks like just like tokens of like, hey, this is an exchange. You're inviting me on your creative outlet. So this is the thing that I do. And in 700 plus interviews, I've had folks send me things or even like this image behind me. I had a, I was an artist that did this for me. And I was like, That's I appreciate cool. you, bro. Mm -hmm. And I keep a creative like altar in the studio. Mm -hmm. And it's the same same way um, as far as what I'm going to have in my home. You know, I have limited space in this this sort of home and the home studio. So not everything comes in here. And I'm very, you know, people send me stuff all the time. And I'm like, I appreciate it. Um, and, you know, kind of going from there. But other instances, like if I'm going to go out and have something that has a certain amount of space, I got to love it. I can't just like it. I got to love it because it is mm -hmm. that sort of energy. It is that sort of soul that's here. And I, you know, and even in the studio, I have a few of my pieces when I thought I was a painter for about six months. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the last one. This is the last one. Um, so in, in, in the, the key point is for fun. Um, cause, uh, I, I do a movie screening series and a, and a movie, po um, a, a podcast, um, about movies, what have you. And, um, sometimes it's like, I got to watch this for work. 
not for fun, you know? <laughs> so it's a different vibe. What is the last movie that you watched for fun? And you're like, all right, I'm going to have the popcorn. I'm going to get lined up or whatever your your choice of of uh, movie going snack is. But what's the last movie that you watched for fun? American fiction for me. <laughs> um, Damsel on Netflix for me. I haven't seen Damsel yet. Saw American fiction. Uh, we, we may have to trade notes on that one, Juanita. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm talking to three people. They were like, so uh, how do you feel being a creator? You got a little monk going on? I was like, hey, maybe a sketch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's it, actually, for the podcast. And in these final moments, um, I want to, one, I want to do two things. One, I want to thank both of you for coming on and being such great guests. This has been a, you know, I knew it was going to be. It's going to be a great treat for Friday. <laughs> going to be wrapping up the week. I'm really happy about this. And, and two, I want to invite and encourage both of you to share website, social media, anything, shameless plugs, if you will, for folks to, um, and as they listen to, to find you and your work and stay up to date. So if you will, the floor is yours. Awesome. Um, well, again, Danielle Eliska is my name and you can find me on Instagram and it's danielle.eliska. Again, that's danielle.eliska on Instagram. And my website is www.danielleeliska.com and that's danielle, D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E, Eliska, E-L-I-S-K-A.com. You can find me both spaces. You can email me and I'll hit you back. You want me to say something? <laughs> you can find me on Instagram at Juanita Anderson underscore film. Um, and my website is in process. So I'm not going to give you that URL right now. Um, but Google me. You might find something. <laughs> I like that. that that's, that's, that's the real one. Like, look, Google me. Google You'll me. Find <laughs> exactly. I'm out here. I'm out Listen, here. only legends can say that. Clearly, we're circling back to like the legendary living, the living legends here. So oh, bless your heart. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Although I do not have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> That's all right. It's soon to come, I'm sure. So one of these listeners, y'all got to get on that. Let's 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 make a Wikipedia page for Juanita Anderson. Yes. <laughs> And there you have it, folks. I want to again thank Danielle Aliska and Juanita Anderson for coming on and sharing a bit about Seed and Bloom and their respective stories. And I'm Rob Lee saying that there's arts, culture, and community in and around your neck of the woods. You've just got to look for it. Music.